You know, after playing so many games over the past years, I'm really enjoying them. I keep finding myself back where it all began. There is this piece of me that regards the original Dark Souls as a masterpiece, and I would really like to share why I regard it to be so. After revisiting it for the 10th time this year, to make a video, I had found myself mesmerized by the flow of the game and how everything just feels like it is interwoven and connects with each other that there is no saying in question that this is one of the best games ever made. Feeling with such high hopes and strong admiration to be put forth to my next journey, I came to a stunning question that I had solemnly raised with myself before. But before we get into that, I would like to just give a moment and ask kindly if you could go down and subscribe please, and give this video a like for more Dark Souls related content to be fed into your suggestion box. Not just from me, but from everyone on YouTube. Thank you. I would also like to thank From Software for their beautiful architecture and world design. And as the late great Miyazaki said, I don't create games, I create worlds. This is truly key in factor of how a successful game can be made, is to have an organic ecosystem running within the game that in itself manifests its, manifests its own life form and takes on its own being and purpose of existence. These types of games keep you immersed in awe as discovering them is more kin to discovering a new city or cave with your friends. You just want to keep on going further to find out what else you have been missing. Now, that brings me to my first question, which I have been missing in my journeys of Laudron, and that is, can you truly beat Dark Souls 1 with the Moonlight Greatsword? Please, stick around for this journey to find out, as we tackle the most groundbreaking way to beat Dark Souls 1 with the Moonlight Greatsword, without modding it in directly with a cheat engine. With this method also used as a guide path for your journeys, I will be walking you through how to truly complete Dark Souls 1 with just the Moonlight Greatsword legitimately, and this can be done on any console or platform with any copy of the game. Right, let's get started. Alright, so we start off in the character creation screen. I choose an apt name which is Luna for the run, a female with faint pale skin and blush complexion, with sharp facial features and aqua green eyes luminescent when you stare in them with matching aqua green hair to appropriately begin this long quest with. As I found the combination of those colours to be symbolic of magic and moonlight, matching the colour of the game's sword in fact. And for our starting class, we will go with the warrior, which we need to do. Due to the simple fact I will bring up later. Best class to start with is the warrior, to be a pure magic greatsword throughout. For the gift, I always choose nothing. <laughs> because I want to experience what the game has to offer and the restrictions at the beginning make it more exhilarating when exploring leading to newer and fresher paths. No gift, we do not need any help. With all that done and our character created, we make our way through the Undead Asylum. We do not have a Moonlight Greatsword yet because it is impossible to obtain one yet legitimately. So we do the best next thing that this game can allow and that is in order to proceed we need the Undead Asylum key, which this Asylum Demon is holding. So we punch the Asylum Demon to death because it's in our path. Um, this actually took a much quicker time than I thought and is much easier than using the broken straight hilt in my opinion. Once the big punching bag is dead, we head on out of the asylum, not before scavenging whatever this desolate hole has to offer in way of souls or gear. Once we make it to Firelink Shrine, we will need to make sure that we have the necessary 2000 souls that we got from the asylum demon and whatever more to put in all our points into strength. This will bring our strength to 16 exactly. Just enough for the minimum stat requirements to wield the Zweihander two-handed. That is why we chose the Warrior to start with. That is the best class to get your hands on a Moonlight Greatsword equivalent early on, straight out the gate. Once we have done that, we want to sprint straight to the graveyard and pick up our trusty Zvi. There is only one issue though. This Zvi does pure physical damage. Something we cannot inflict. It either needs to be like DS3 Moonlight Greatsword and mix between magic and physical or pure magical altogether. And also needs to be in the Greatsword equivalent variety. So that leaves us with no attack power until we get some magic infusion into this baby. So off to the catacombs it is then. Sprint your way all the way through the catacombs and make your way to the bottom. If you memorize the routes until you meet with the blacksmith Vamos, we need to retrieve the green titanite shard just on the ledge before dropping in to see Vamos the blacksmith, for this is crucial for turning our rock of steel into a steel of magical rock power, or something like that. Anyway, 
This will be a stand-in for our Moonlight Greatsword for now, okay? So hit the bonfire. We have no other options of weapon ascension unless we want to fist the Taurus Demon to death. So we can start here and farm enough souls for 9 Titanite Shard. To do this, we can use the exploding skulls to kill the pinwheel skeletons by baiting the skeletons to the skulls explosions. Now this can be very frustrating, it took me a while to muster up the 7200 souls required, but my tip at uh, 400 a pop, 400 souls a pop is to spend everything you got ASAP. When you have enough for one shard, that should keep you at a surplus all the time, all the way until the 9 shards that you need. Be patient and watch out for the Black Knight. Most importantly of all, don't let the skeletons kill the blacksmith. Quit out if you have to. We need to get our Zweihander to plus 5 for any magical ascension to be done on it. Once farming is complete, you can kill Pinwheel Boss for the Rite of Kindling. I didn't because it is not necessary with my health. Uh, 10 Esther Shards is more than enough for me at this point. You know, I could go through the whole game with just 10, even though 20 is a luxury. Um, while you're here, you can kill Pinwheel if you want to, or you can just climb your way out of the catacombs and um, begin our next step. This again can be tricky, but with the right quit outs and patience and memorizing the routes again throughout, you know, the right stages of where to go in the catacombs and using patience, it can be easier than you expect it to be to uh, get out of the catacombs. Ascend to glory. Head back to Firelink Shrine just to descend into derelict territory, the swampy avarice, the flooded cities with bloated corpses piled up its walls. First, we pick up the Firekeeper soul, littered by ghostly spookies. Then we need to head straight to New Londo ruins to meet up with Rickard of Vinheim. He is key to turning out the piece of dull metal into a shiny elemental cattle prod of destruction. We need to use that green shard we got to turn this plus five into a plus zero magical Zweihander. Perfect. Now we can finally do some damage on this run. Finally, no more fisticuffs today. At this point, the normal game's walkthrough will seem like a distant memory. A dream walk like you have walked before. Let's just say, I'm not happy with this weapon though. It is not the Moonlight Grain Sword. And there is but one more weapon that we can acquire that is as close to resembling the Moonlight Greatsword as possible before actually having the Moonlight Greatsword. But in order for that to be obtained, we must push forward. On through Undead Berg. I decided myself to mutilate and murder Mr. Undead Merchant for the key due to my lack of souls and due to the lack of needing him at any point in this new game cycle. Poor Lady Yulia, we must make haste. Onwards to the Taurus Demon. This Vi really packs a punch. It does stagger this demon very well and does exceptionally more damage than I thought it would exceptional, but not good enough. We need to obtain a doppelganger of the Moonlight Greatsword. We need the Claymore. We will obtain it over the Wyvern Bridge. Make sure not to die here and do kick down the ladder for a shortcut to the bonfire in case of emergencies. We finally have reached the closest point to the Moonlight Greatsword, but we are never done. We need this baby magic, and the only way I know how is through 9 Titanite Shards and a green Titanite Shard. So, off we go. We head over through to the Undead Parish and farm off some extra souls to purchase enough Titanite Shards to make our Claymore into plus 5. Then we head off to the next available green Titanite Shard there is at this point of the game. It should be in the smaller broken tower next to the Drain Lever in New Londo Ruins on a corpse at the ledge. Now, we finally have our magical claymore, our beam of energy that sources magic through the tip of our palms into the flesh of our enemies, rendering their veins cavernous and empty. Done. My mind is tunnel vision at this point. All I am focused on pursuing is that Moonlight Greatsword, and cannot settle for any more substitutions. The things that are standing in the way of that sword are... Those things. That thing. Ugh. That thing. And those two dinglebats. Oh. Did I forget to mention Sen's Fortress? So, that's what we need dead. Those things standing between us and the Moonlight Greatsword. In order to progress, I went up through the Undead Parish and slayed my gargoyles, rang the Bell of Awakening, that's one out of two by the way, then descended my way down the ladder to be met with Shock of Oswald, just stalking me down there, waiting for me to come up to him. Creepy fellow. Tricks are for kids, okay? Now our bell is awoke. We need to head below. We don't have the master key, man. So the only way to go is would be through the Darkroot Basin and the Valley of the Drakes. So that is our next place of travel. I pick up the RTSR for good measure. 
uh, because we might need it later. And it's it's just a no-brainer since we're not leveling Vigor. And from here on out that we have magic weapons, all my levers I will be dumping into intelligence. There will be no other uh, stat distribution. And every level we get from the beginning to now and for the rest of the game will go straight into intelligence. So this is the base vitality we are working with right now. The one we started with. Which for NG is more than enough to get by in my opinion. And still feel that, you can still feel that invigorating Dark Souls experience. Make our way through Blight Town and we kill one of the Daughter of Chaos. We ring our bell, now that's 2 out of 2 if you are following at home. And while we are here... Activate the Daughter of Chaos Bonfire and head down to Ceaseless Discharge. This kill can be trivialized by his first encounter through running all the way back to the fog wall after picking up his sister's clothes, then waiting for him to lunge at you, and while he is suspended in thin air, no ground under him, attack his hand until he is forced to let go off of the cliffside and plummet to his death, netting this an easy victory royale. The swamps have been drained, and now we can clinically say we are not insane. Sane. Head back to non-infernal swamps. Now I'm talking about the disease swamps, not the uh, hot tucky Dorito after bowl effect swamps. And we need to farm ourselves the upgrades necessary to make this armament potent enough to withstand upcoming combat. We need to kill these green slugs until we get two drops from these guys. These guys drop five apiece, so after the second green titanite shard drop, you should be good to go, and off we go to the next Crow of Events. We pick up the Firekeeper Soul for a kamikaze run in the uh, Black Town uh, depths. We casually stroll our way to the New Londo ruins using the conveniently placed New Londo gate key in this chest by the ladders. And given we retained enough souls or popped what is needed, we can finally ascend our magic claymore to plus five. So, off to the fun house we go. Now, there is not really much to get here rather than speed running ASAP to Ornstein and Smo. That's what I have on my mind. Tunnel vision to that moon Moonlight Greatsword. So, I make my way as fast as possible to the Iron Golem and get him with a kill that sends him flying off the cliffside. We reach the Sunshine City and bum rush our way to ONS, not before getting teleported to another player's graveyard world and defeating him like a boss. Totally not gank this guy, is pure edge all his way, not my bad whatsoever, he did all the work, totally not. Now that has been cleared up. We do not die a thousand times to the painted guardians in my one mistake ruins everything plot walking across the catwalk rafters and meet the Anor Londo archer with a smile and head off to ONS. Now, I have to say, I have done a lot of Ornstein and Smo fights, but this one in comparison was a cakewalk. Has to be the easiest boss in this whole run. I don't know if it was the experience I have on them or the magic infusion that is like a surefire tactic on their armor, but it synergized so well and felt really relieving to complete. This fight went really well, like the damage was so sufficient enough and just the telegraphed attacks that Ornstein gave me were just so easy to just punish. I mean, two hits, Ornstein stabbed daggers and you know just easy and obviously you get an easy smo fight at the end if you let him just jump up to you and you get your free hits in the only thing you need to worry about on smo would be his uh bum jump attacks uh that you know aoe lightning so guys we have the lord vessel in her might majesty and succulence we need to place this baby as one less step towards our goal go to filing shrine and place the lord vessel and all golden seals to the lord soul bosses shall be broken netting us access to the further bosses of the game. I totally aced the Duke skip. <sighs> no worries, man. This Duke skip's easy. Like, not 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 like I tried it a hundred times and just don't understand the nuance of it, but then I head down to kindle the Duke's archive bonfire just to get, you know, enough flasks for the uh, boss fight. Now, this is the hardest part of the run. We need to cut Seath's tail, but there is a caveat, however. We can't get it in more than four hits if we're lucky with our power that we have right now until we are steamrolled by his attacks or cursed. That is a frustration meter that I really don't want to attend to. After hours of trial and error with tail cuts on death, I had to rethink my strategy. We need to rethink our game plan. Our weapon isn't hitting his limp noodle hard enough for a tail cut. 
So I jimmy my ass to all available blue titanite chunks in the game as pickups and then farm the rest for a plus 10 magic claymore. That should definitely do it. We need to kill that black knight in the dark root basin with the uh, black knight halberd for a guaranteed blue chunk. You can farm the crystal golems here too at lower enemy health as they drop them as well. Guaranteed. But then after that we need to go to the great hollow and get the two chunks there that are, are on corpses which are easy well drops. One is on a lower branch by the tree and the other one just on a ledge past the vine flooring. Then we get the rest from the golems patrolling around the duke's archives garden. This is a very nice scenic event for me and I chose this place to farm the uh, blue chunks, the rest of the blue chunks. And there is also one blue chunk on a corpse here as well. Last but not least, we need the slab. I will leave here the navigation path for you to follow so you can remember where to step and follow it um, point by point and where not to step as well. In the invisible lands of Hogwarts. Now, we have the necessary juice to spruce up our battlefront. Make sure you're at RTSR range and have the correct wit and mindset, then get in that arena. Huddle your body by his crystal, but don't break it. Wait for his stubby body to waddle its way towards you, then wait for him to do an attack. So, basically at this point, once you see him, stop moving towards you, and um, he stays still, and he's winding up. As soon as he starts, his head looks like it's about to wind up an attack, immediately sprint to the back of him. Doing so while he's attacking, he will break his own crystal, stunning himself, giving you the wide opportunity, as narrow as it may be, and uh, time uh, strength, to do a jumping attack on his tail. And with enough luck, on the second jump attack, it will cut and hallelujah! I have never been more excited in my life seeing a tail cut achieved. We, we've done it. We have the Moonlight Greatsword. Yo, game over. Just kidding. We need to finish the game now with it. So, we have been using this subsidiary weapon as uh, placeholders. Now we have officially acquired the Moonlight Greatsword legitimately. Our real journey begins here. We can now take on the four major bosses of the game and do it with style. Now, it is the best time to buy the repair box so we can repair our Moonlight Greatsword after every battle we engage in as we will be using the Moonlight Beam as a big source of damage. With our intelligence scaling, this should do a hefty punch. This sword does pure magic damage, no physical, and has an S scaling with intelligence when fully upgraded. So that is what we are going to do. We gather all available dragon scales laying around in the game. There is one in a chest in Blight Town by the bonfire, and uh, three we can pick up in Ash Lake. One to the left of the Black Hydra, one in the Hollow Tree, and one at the end of the beach past the giant barnacles. From here, we can go ahead and kill the named enemies that dropped the last of the dragon scales for us before we begin farming for the rest. That will lead us to a highly upgraded Moonlight Greatsword, uh, max Moonlight Greatsword upgrade. We awesomely merc the Black Hydra for two dragon scales that it can drop us in the Ash Lake while we're here. Then we can go back to the Dark Root Basin and murder the Hydra there for a dragon scale. But at this point, with warping available, is when I decided to kill Pinwheel for the Rite of Kindling. I held it off for this long and since we have the MGS, we don't need to hold off on killing any more bosses uh, than necessary. And then for the last world drop, we can get it from the Undead Dragon by the Valley of the Drakes. There is also one in the Painted World, but I don't don't insist on going there yet. Now is time to farm the rest. We need a total of 10 dragon scales for a plus 5 weapon, which is the max weapon ascension for dragon weapons. So we farm the last two via the blue drakes in the valley of the drakes using the dark root basin bonfire near the black knight halberd. We 
might need a few more souls to upgrade because the upgrade cost for the dragon weapons are 10,000 souls a pop. So let's take this opportunity to acquire the Abyss Walker ring and go through Dark Root and kill Sif for his souls. I know Sif is a girl, but I always call dogs good boys in real life, even if they are girls, it's a habit. Now we have finally got the maximum upgrade Moonlight Greatsword. Pat yourselves on the back for making it this far, guys. This is the beginning of the end. I realize this is the most potent time for some drip, so I head up to the Moonlight Butterfly boss room to merc her and retrieve the Undead Berg Tower key so we can get Havel's ring and afford to wear at least minimal decent specs. After combination matching, I went for a style that is as effective as attractive. I went Knight's Armor, Black Leather Gloves, and the Sorcerer's Trousers. With whatever mats we've acquired over our journey, which is the physical path, we use those to upgrade our armor because we will not be needing normal ascension for this run. I storm my way through the catacombs to take out the weakest link in my opinion. Though the rest of the story bosses are all a cakewalk from here on out, trust me. Uh, with this Moonlight Greatsword, um, even with their magic resistances, they are no match for our star power. This does a lot of damage, uh, like 500 a hit. And for a great sword, it staggers, it's really good. And we start from below and work our way to the top. We go to Lord Nido's boss room and strategically kill him, using his AoE blasts and area of effect attacks to disable the skeletons around him as we maneuver and slowly dwindle his health down to zero. And just a tip of reference for anyone trying to kill Nido, you don't need a uh, holy weapon or anything if you wanna save time. Just block the AoE, it does not do that much damage, uh, especially with the um, Grass Crest Shield. doesn't do that much damage, it just staggers you and takes like a tiny slither of your health, and it disables the, those skellies around you, giving you more ample time to attack and defeat Lord Nido. With our first Lord Soul out of the way, we can make our way up to the next target of opportunity. Kill Fire Sage. Make a mockery of Centipede, and trivialize the most gimmicky boss of all time, the Timing Boss. With our second Lord Soul acquired, we are finally making some good progress to finishing the game. I am happy at this point. We go through New Londo ruins, grab the key from Ingwood, and drain the swamp. Drain that swamp, baby. But before we proceed to our next boss soul shard, I pay a quick visit to an old friend and knock the lights out of him, and pick up a peculiar looking doll along the way, and the crest shield while we are here. Though not necessary, as the block from the grass crest shield is not that bad, and you can really use the stamina recovery in this next DPS check. But nonetheless, we proceed. Head down into the abyss, and kill the four kings for their boss soul shard. At this point, we have dumped all our points into intelligence, and with our 60 intelligence so far, our output of the max upgraded Moonlight Greatsword is doing 500 damage. That is the highest you will see it go. Any more intelligence added just adds one damage every one to two levels. Though it may seem negligible, for this run, appropriate, and that's what we'll be doing. We can uh, level our mind straight all the way. We don't need to dump any more points in anything but intelligent. At this point, we can finally face the Duke that has kept us waiting for so long. This one boss that caused us all that trouble from the get-go. Seath the Scaleless. He's going down. Proficiently too. Even with all our magic output, this guy still gets slapped around like a wet noodle piece of. Anyway, let's head down. Use the same strategy as before, let him break his own crystal, then just go to town. Bait out his long range attack, which will spell laser crystals far from him, then close in with the close range attacks. It's a fairly easy and trivial fight. He is telegraphed to do a major AoE when the player is near his body. So keep your camera situated above, watching his head and arms at all times while attacking his body. So you know when he is about to do that. You'll see like a crystal beam that he clutches. You want to get out of there at that when you see that. We have everything in the bag. We can just stroll on down to Gwyn right now and end the game right here. But we still have unfinished business to attend to. I make my way straight to Capra Demon and beam his ass to oblivion as my first choice of optional boss. Then make my way down through the gutter depths and fight with the gaping dragon, which was incredibly easy for this level of the game. Then we go back to Anor Londo, kill the firekeeper there for the last firekeeper soul for juice on our drink, and kill Gwendolyn. Head through the painted world, pull the lever, leaving us access to the royal princess, and we kill Priscilla, invisible but deadly. With all those Anor Londo optional bosses out of the way, we make our way to the next boss on 
on the roster. Not before killing the two side gargoyles uh, on the bridge in Anorlondo. We go back to the Berg and kill the fire bridge Wyvern, which with long range projectiles makes my life much easier and noble. Now, it's DLC time baby and the run is slowly closing out. Underestimate the forward headbutt attacks of the Sanctuary Garden too many times that I care to admit and gain access into Sanctuary. Our goals are set on the warrior Artorius. Have a noble and prosperous fight with the Abyss Walker himself and enjoy every second of it until we find ourselves in the township of Ulusil. Now we can go ahead and use the Skull Lantern to acquire the Silver Pendant through the Illusory Wall. But honestly, I have never done that on my runs ever and not even on this run so I never need to do that. Not even, no need to do that now. We kill the monstrosity with a dick coming out of its head to gain access to the Abyss prison cells. We can make a quick shortcut back to the township of Ulusil for our fully kindled bonfire for access to Manus. So Manus, um, this is a game for the long haul. You need to stick it out and endure it to the end. Don't rush with this guy. Punish each attack one at a time and make it to the end and you will get there. Just dodge his attacks appropriately at the right times and punish each one and you will succeed. I love this fight guys. With the big man down, we have our last and final boss of the run until the big cheat. That is the black dragon Calamite. I talked to my good mate Goff to fire down the bat in the sky for an easy victory royal out with the beast. The only tips I can give for this fight, um, this is a slowly telegraphed attack fight, so, um, I slowly telegraph my attacks and dodge backwards from his melees, so when he goes for a headbutt, you want to be dodging backwards. I dodge into his standing up on his hind legs, and, um, when he, uh, fire projectiles when he stands up on his hind legs, and side to side accordingly, to net this 8 minute long fight a victory Dealing only 100 damage a swing with our pure magical weapon really nets us not much of a choice and wiggle room for success, but um, we had to wait it out to the end. This was a battle of attrition and the, the your real friend is knowing when to dodge and all these attacks memorized. That's your real friend of this fight. Your fight isn't DPS, it's uh, knowing uh, what, to, uh, uh, what to dodge and where to dodge it to. What direction? Because this game offers uh, omnidirectional dodging, so you want to know which direction you want to be dodging for what attack. Now, we are pretty much um, at the end right now. We can parry Gwyn to death and make it to victory. So the question is, I wanted to ask from the beginning, can you beat Dark Souls 1 with just the Moonlight Greatsword? Well, as I have shown, yes. Yes, you can. With the right tools at your disposal and having a realistic outset of the goals you wish to achieve, this has been a successful Moonlight Greatsword only run. Yo, thank you for watching.